Good afternoon. Uh, clearly, if you looked at an earlier copy of the schedule, I am not Rabbi Bruce Lustig from Washington Hebrew Congregation. I'm Rabbi Sue Shankman, also from Washington Hebrew Congregation, and I am honored to join with you today and to welcome and introduce our speaker for the Elizabeth and Richard Dubin Family Foundation Lecture. Rabbi Lustig did ask me to share a few words of reflection expressing our collective appreciation for the Dubin family, whom we thank for this opportunity. And as a parent of an incoming college freshman, I know how important it is to have these conversations and dialogues on the college campus. We particularly remember Dick Dubin today. For Dick, just as it continues to be for his cherished wife, Liz, life is about the relationships we create. Dick could and would befriend anyone with his Boston accent, his gregarious personality, and of course, his infectious laugh, which disarmed and put everyone at ease. He was beloved throughout the community in business, faith, and most of all, family. How appropriate that today's lecture is about the family relationships between and among our Jewish community in Israel and America. Perhaps no one has more insight to the complexity of that relationship than Rabbi Rick Jacobs. Rabbi Jacobs is the president of the Union for Reform Judaism, which is comprised of over 900 congregations, serving approximately 1.5 million people. In that role, he has overseen a vision for the future of Judaism and for Reform Judaism through the lens of core principles of strengthening congregations, audacious hospitality, and tikkun olam. Prior to taking on the leadership of the entire reform movement, Rabbi Jacob spent 20 years as the dynamic, visionary, spiritual leader of Westchester Reform Temple in Scarsdale, New York, the next door neighbor congregation to my home family congregation. So I got to see him in action and witness the changes and the vibrancy of his congregation, and always was a little bit jealous. There he transformed his congregation through rethinking and re-envisioning worship and learning experiences creating a vibrant, a vibrant culture of inclusion, and providing meaningful, impactful opportunities to forge relationships with the community and with Judaism. <clears throat> he has carried that same philosophy into his work on behalf of the reform movement, and most certainly into his work on behalf of Israel. Rabbi Jacobs <clears throat> is deeply committed to the state of Israel. He has studied for two decades at Jerusalem's Shalom Hartman Institute, where he is now a senior rabbinic fellow. He is a voice for progressive Judaism in Israel, ensuring that voice does not get lost, drowned out, or disregarded. In fact, through his leadership, that voice has been amplified far beyond what it has ever been. He is simultaneously an attentive listener, a tireless advocate, and a thoughtful and committed partner to all sides of the conversation. Please join me in welcoming Rabbi Rick Jacobs. Good afternoon, and thank you. I want to say a special word of thank you to my friend, Rabbi Sue Shankman. Um, it's wonderful to be here to not just reflect on the big issues in front of us, but also the deep bonds of not only rabbinic colleagues, but of congregations of depth and purpose, which of course is a Washington Hebrew. I want to also say a word, if I could, of appreciation to my uh, longtime friend, Dr. Yoram Perry. Uh, when you reached out, before even you got the invitation in the first sentence, the answer was yes, I would be honored. I love your work as a journalist, as an editor, as an advocate, as a scholar, uh, most of all, as a friend. Um, I'd like to just say it's just a privilege to be here at the University of Maryland and, of course, to be with my uh, friends and colleagues, but also all kinds of wonderful people that I don't yet know. Uh, but in the rich discourse this morning, I think I already have a sense of some of the vitality and some of the intensity of the community that we have here. And particularly to the students, I, I would just reach out and say, um, it is so critical for us to think about uh, the way in which we create the culture of deep discourse. The ability to argue, to reflect, and to never stop asking hard questions. And I would say to the students especially, don't ever stop asking questions and don't let anyone delegitimize your views. To ground this, uh, this kind of opening of 
intensity and debate, discussion. Let's just think about for 2,000 years, we've had this unbelievable Jewish tradition, particularly our Talmudic sages, uh, who taught us that fearless, rigorous, and constructive debates about the most urgent issues are not things to politely allow. They're actually the reason we are here. We're taught in the Talmud, in tractate Eruvin, Elu ve'elu divrei Elohim chayim, these arguments, these views, and these views, not separately, but together, are the words of the living God. Uh, even with those with whom we disagree, they also are created with Selim Elohim in the image of God. And yes, you know what? Even those opponents sometimes are right. Before I continue, I, I just have to weigh in uh, because I heard, of course, the discussion this morning. And I have to comment on debate and a topic that's just ripped out of the headlines uh, this morning in particular. So an Israeli-born, deeply committed Zionist whose artistic pursuits have recently focused on Zionist themes decides that she is troubled enough by, quote, recent events, recent actions of the Israeli government to forgo a chance to join Prime Minister Netanyahu on a stage to receive a prestigious award. Now, you've already long fingered out who I'm talking about. Of course, Natalie Portman. And I just want to say loudly and clearly I would not have made the same decision that she did. I would have, I hope, used that platform not to speak quietly, but to speak passionately about the things that are urgent not only to me, but I believe to the majority of uh, Jews in the world. But not for one minute do I doubt Portman's love for and commitment to Israel. Those who are busy demonizing her, and they're working overtime, questioning the legitimacy of her views, they're poisoning the discourse that we need. This is not a healthy debate, friends. Again and again, we need to remind ourselves, Elu ve'elu divrei Elohim chayim, these and those are the words of the living God. So even as we celebrate Israel, we must look at our beloved nation without the rose-colored glasses. We must open our arms to discussion and debate, especially among the young who are asking the most profound questions. Israel, even at 70, is indeed still young, inspiring, and yes, innovative. Practically every day, the world benefits from a new Israeli invention, a new high-tech app that we can't imagine how we've ever lived without, a medical device that serves countless lives, and a way to desalinate water to fend off droughts and so much more. You know the whole story. Israel is also a modern day miracle. Banished from our historic homeland, dispersed across the globe for 2,000 years, the Jewish people dreamed of rebuilding their ancient commonwealth. Indeed, the Jewish people's efforts to return to its homeland is, I believe, the oldest national liberation struggle in the history of the world. Since the start of the modern Zionist movement, Jews have settled in Israel from all across the globe, some fleeing persecution and seeking safety, some to link their lives and their futures with the modern state of Israel. I am personally grateful to Israel for so many blessings. Chief among them is that Israel has been an anchor and an inspiration in my life. No matter how often I land at Ben Gurion Airport, and I land there a lot, I never fail to feel a rush of emotion and a deep sense of homecoming. Who among us can forget the extraordinary experience of being able to walk to the Western Wall on their first trip to Israel, to tread on the same ground on which King David and King Solomon stood, where Amos, Micah, and Isaiah inspired, where Hillel and Shammai debated, and where for much of the past 3,000 years, Jews of all kinds walked, talked, prayed, and lived. is an experience filled with wonderment, even reverence. Add to that the dazzling wonders of the new Israel, the cosmopolitan bustle of Tel Aviv, the natural beauty of Haifa, the beaches of Elat. I'm also inspired by the vision of Israel's founders. 
There is perhaps no better time than now to repeat the words written by the nation's founders that so express their hope and expectations for our Jewish homeland. It's the vision that made the modern day miracle of Israel, but it is a vision still unrealized. And I'll quote, the state of Israel will be open for Jewish immigration and for the ingathering of the exiles, foster the development of the country for the benefit of all its inhabitants. It will be based on freedom, justice, and peace as envisioned by the prophets of Israel. It will ensure complete equality of social and political rights to all its inhabitants, irrespective of religion, race, or sex. It will guarantee freedom of religion, conscience, language, education, and culture. It will safeguard the holy places of all religions, and it will be faithful to the principles of the Charter of the United Nations. I sometimes wonder if the Israeli Declaration of Independence were to be read in the Knesset today by a member of, let's just say, one of the opposition parties, would they be shouted down or worse? I was in Tel Aviv a few weeks ago joining with tens of thousands of Israelis, including our Israeli reform movement, to protest against the government's decision to deport more than 40,000 asylum seekers. I was there for the Conference of Presidents annual mission, and it was just before the Jewish Agency board meeting, and I was there with a group of young college students from our reform movement here in North America, a few from the United Kingdom, and two from Paris. And we went together to this protest in South Tel Aviv. It was, it was remarkable to be there, to feel the strength of Israel's democratic core, the prophetic justice that was coursing through that community. As we held up our placards, uh, that you know the heart of the stranger, for you were strangers in the land of Egypt. A fundamental narrative, and we held those signs, and the college students I was with were not just holding a sign, those signs reflected a core of who they were. We arrived at the Jewish Agency board meeting in Zichon Yaakov, and we're having a debate for the first time I can remember in recent years about whether the Jewish Agency, that venerable organization, really one of the Zionist pillars, with leadership from all over the Jewish world, from all over the spectrum of Jewish life, would we take a stance on the asylum seekers? I had to say, my guess was that we wouldn't. But in the debate, and there was a rich debate, and a kind of respectful but very intense debate, and then there were these two members of our delegation, two college students, both from the United States, and they were signaling to Natan Sharansky, could they have the microphone? I don't know about you, but uh, young people aren't waiting for their turn to lead. They're actually leading right now. We just all haven't paid proper notice. And so Natan, being the educator that he is, said, of course. And they came forward. They took the microphone. Rachel Wolf, who is from a wonderful Reformed congregation in uh, Northern California, basically challenged all the Jewish leaders, Natan Sharansky, and frankly, the entire state of Israel and the entire world. But hey, when you're young, you can do anything. She said, excuse me, is it possible that the Jewish agency will not raise its voice on such an urgent matter of justice? What does the Jewish tradition teach us? What does the state of Israel stand for if it won't have a voice? And if you do not raise that voice, you will be forsaking not only my generation, you'll be forsaking all the generations that have come before. Gulp. Can I tell you how the vote went? I think you can probably guess from the passion of that speech that the vote went that we need to raise our voice as a, as a Jewish agency that was orthodox and reform and secular and conservative and Mizrahi and Ashkenazi. It was the full gamut. And we raised a voice. And that voice, I hope, echoes not just in today's discourse, but throughout our Jewish world that we can and must raise our voices for the things that matter most. And we can't turn a blind eye to issues that strike at the core of Israel's values and her commitment to democracy. Nor should we, as partners in our support for Israel, our voices, they have to be heard. They are from a place of love, but also a place of urgent, urgent prophetic cry. Right now, Prime Minister Netanyahu is trying to push through the Knesset 
a proposal to strip the Supreme Court of much of its power. This is going on at a moment we must not allow Israeli democracy, which is so key to its own security and its global support, to erode the core institutions of that democracy. And of course, there is the subject that seems so intractable. We would be negligent in our embrace and endorsement of the Zionist dream were we not to seek and to end the ongoing occupation of another people. The still unresolved but urgent stalemate between Israelis and Palestinians, it simply cannot be ignored. And I'm not naive. We are not close to a two-state solution. I'm not telling you something you don't already know, but this is clear. There can be no legitimate Jewish state that is not a democracy. I'm not saying that from de Tocqueville or John Locke. I'm saying that from the core of the Jewish tradition. God didn't create uh, people on separate levels. And equality and justice, these are fundamentals of the Jewish tradition. And therefore, to say that you could imagine a Jewish state that's not democratic is to, is to undermine the very pillars of the Jewish tradition. A one-state solution that would deny Palestinians any claim to sovereignty would result in the abandonment of either the Jewish or the democratic essence of modern Israel. And I gotta tell you, I couldn't live without those two together. And the occupation is real. As Ariel Sharon, hardly a left-wing progressive Zionist, noted back in 2003, he said, and I quote, you may not like the word, but what is happening is an occupation. To hold 3.5 million Palestinians under occupation, I believe, concludes Sharon, that is a terrible thing for Israel and for the Palestinians. We must protect Israel's security without doubt. But a robust debate is underway in Israel about whether or not settlements truly make Israel more secure. It divides the Israeli public, Israeli politicians, security service heads, uh, IDF commanders, and many of the military and security chiefs believe that one can be deeply committed to Israel's security and well-being and fully supportive of the right of Palestinians to a homeland next to Israel. Let me be clear. We North American Jews cannot and should not make Israel policy decisions. The people of Israel live and die by those decisions. But Israelis must listen to the voice and opinions of those who are devoted to Israel's well-being and can offer perspectives they may miss. In that spirit, we will challenge those who wrongly suggest that lovers of Israel must support the extreme ideology of the settler movement as part of the core of Zionism. We will show up in Israel and here in North America proudly wearing our social justice and deep ethical commitments. This is fully in keeping with important strands of Zionist thought in influential thinkers like Achad Am, A.D. Gordon, Henrietta Zoll, Judah Magnus, and I could go on and on. American support for Israel has long been anchored in the American people's <coughs> belief in the justness and rightness of Israel's cause and in our sense of shared democratic and moral values with Israel. But Israel's support comes not only from the American people's attachment, it also comes from the breadth and depth of the American Jewish community's support. And it is a dangerous development that apparently those in the highest echelons of Israeli's government think that they can trade this deep, broad, and significant support and substitute it with a coalition of conservative evangelical Christians and segments of the Orthodox Jewish community. In doing so, they threaten the very fabric of American support for Israel. Equally alarming, the impact of this approach is to tear at the bonds of Jewish unity, undercutting the dream of Israel's founding generation to create a Jewish homeland not for some of the Jews, not for the Jews who are like me or the Jews who I am in uh, coalition with. The dream of Zionism was to create a state of Israel for all of us. I recently spoke at the J Street Conference where I was inspired, as I always am, by the smarts and the spirit of the young people in attendance. There were 12 
hundred campus activists from J Street U who fight tirelessly on their campuses for progressive Zionism and for Israel. I was also at the APAC conference earlier this year and I was delighted when it invited as presenters on the main plenary stage many influential progressives in Israel and, reach, and they have been reaching out to progressives in the US. I applauded them for this and encouraged them to expand and deepen this approach. There needs to be a counterbalance to the efforts of some Republican partisan elements and yes of the Israeli government's Prime Minister Netanyahu that are undermining the bipartisan support that has been so critical to Israel's survival. Likewise, those of us who are progressive have a special responsibility to work hard to maintain support for Israel writ large, even among our fellow progressives who show clear signs of being alienated by Israel's policies, particularly by its treatment of the Palestinians. If the broad bipartisan support breaks apart, and this is not an idle possibility, there's no doubt in my mind that Israel's future could be in jeopardy. And there is another factor severely threatening Israel's future. Through the years, Israeli Prime Ministers Rabin, Perez, Olmert, and Sharon took courageous steps towards peace. Today, however, the Prime Minister of Israel will no longer even say that he is committed to a two-state solution. To illustrate this, I want to just reflect with you on three recent speeches that I heard and probably all of us heard about. The first when Vice President Mike Pence addressed the Israeli Knesset this past January. He acknowledged the long-standing U.S. policy that is support for a secure Israel side by side with the future Palestinian state. But there was nearly stone-cold silence among the Israeli political leaders. It was a shocking moment, frankly. A second speech, Howard Kaur, the lead uh, the lead of all things APAC, stood up in front of the massive APAC gathering on the Sunday night of the convention, and he said out loud his support for two states for two peoples. He said it in the big conference, he said it right in the microphone, and I can tell you, in that big cavernous hall, there was barely a little applause. Finally, very recently at the J Street conference, one uh, member of Knesset, Tsipi Libni, stress the urgency for two states, there also appeared to be scant enthusiasm among the audience there as well. I have to say that was the most surprising. So a few minutes after her talk, we had a panel. Uh, I had a chance to meet with a group of the J Street U leaders and I asked them, interpret that moment for me, please. We just heard C.P. Livni, the former uh, Minister of Justice and Foreign Minister, someone who's really sharp and clear, uh, why was it that there was not even some you know, modest applause in the hall? And they told me it's not because they and their peers have abandoned the two-state solution. They said the dream to them appears so elusive, it's hard to be enthusiastic. What has happened indeed to the two-state option? We have an Israeli government that appears neutral at best to support two states for two peoples. A current U.S. administration that is on record for maintaining long-standing U.S. policy for two states, but without a clear path toward accomplishing that goal. Though, I must stress that were President Trump to indeed introduce and pursue a viable two-state option, our reform movement would be not only applauding would be out there working shoulder to shoulder. And we have a new generation that views the idea of a two-state option as a distant dream at best, my three examples as your evidence. There's simply no other just option, however, other than the two states for two peoples. No other just option that will maintain and fortify the Zionist dream. The myopia with which those who oppose two states or silently acquiesce to the creeping annexation of settlements that makes two states impossible, endangers the dream of Israel and Israel's security as well. Of course, it imperils the morality of our beloved Jewish state and our people's most cherished beliefs. 
We are at a critical moment where there's a new belief among some in Israel's leadership that indeed the status quo can be sustained. Or even worse, there's a way for the continuing growth of settlements in the West Bank that can be sustained and Israel will maintain its democracy and its place on the world stage. This is an illusion, my friends, a dangerous illusion. A couple of weeks ago, just before Pesach, I had the unexpected honor of meeting with the Crown Prince of Saudi Arabia, Mohammed bin Salman. He made clear to us, it was a small group of us, uh, we were representing the three Abrahamic faiths. We had uh, two wonderful Catholic leaders, and then we had representatives from the, the three major streams of Judaism. And uh, we had an intimate conversation with the crown prince. And he expressed the moment in his own language and his desire for there to be a new day in Saudi Arabia. But we know that the, the kingdom still severely represses religious minorities, restricts the rights of women across the globe, has sponsored schools and religious organizations that have inculcated Salafi extremist messages in several generations of students. Uh, but there are clear signs, both privately and publicly, that Saudi Arabia wants to turn a new corner. When it came to be my opportunity to say something to the Crown Prince, we had just a few moments that reminded me of the panel discussion a few moments ago, kind of, while you're standing on one foot, can you say something? I shared with the Crown Prince a story, a story of what happens when you live in a country that values and defends the rights of all faiths to stand clear to their beliefs. The story is in Victoria, Texas, one of our smallest congregations. And on a, a day last year, when the local mosque was burned to the ground, I am so unbelievably proud of our reform lay leaders who picked themselves up minutes after the fire consumed this Muslim house of prayer, and they showed up at the leaders of the mosque home, and they handed him a set of keys. He said, your house of prayer has been consumed in flames, so you will pray in our house of prayer, and we will be uplifted by sharing our sacred space. I told that story to the crown prince, and I said, my takeaway from that is that when you create real religious freedom, real respect for the faith diversity that is in our world, it doesn't weaken, it strengthens us, because we stand up for one another. When the, the cemetery in Philadelphia last year was desecrated, who was the first religious community to stand with the Jewish community? It was the Muslim community. And then came the Protestants, and the Catholics, and the Sikhs, and the Buddhists, and everyone. That is the power of who we are. I hope, I hope, I hope the Crown Prince not only heard, but has the courage to do that in Saudi Arabia. Now the Arab Peace Initiative, with the strong backing of the Saudis, offers an extraordinary promise for Israel. If Israel is willing to embrace it, must not be led astray by foolhardy ideas that Israel can make a lasting peace with a broad swath of the Arab world by ignoring the urgency of the two-state solution. There's no detour to peace without resolving the Israel-Palestine impasse. The very real security threats that live along Israel's borders and within the region combined with missed opportunities Israeli leaders let pass, uh, peace has become elusive. Believe Israel must take every legitimate opportunity to pursue peace. There's no simple, no, no, no security, there's no safety, there's no justice without, without that. And maintaining the status quo is simply not a long-term viable solution, morally, security-wise, and in every way. And while we're on the subject, let it be clear, I believe, in my opinion, Palestinians have also rarely missed an opportunity to miss an opportunity in advancing the cause of peace. However, I'd like to address the second urgent matter facing the Jewish communities of North America and Israel. It's a simple one. Who are we as a Jewish people? Are we a supplicant diaspora living our lives outside of the Jewish homeland of Israel? Or are we partners in carving out a viable and vibrant Jewish future? I think you probably can guess where I stand but I love seeing the, uh, the straw poll that uh, was taken earlier. And we have a sense of where you stand on this, and it's powerful to imagine. 
We can't ignore the reality that today there are two great centers of Jewish life. Four out of five Jews on the planet live in two places, Israel and North America. Wonder what five cities in the world have the largest Jewish population? Here's a little experiment. See if you can spot the pattern and see what our reality is in the following. What's the fifth largest Jewish city in the world? Jerusalem, with uh, just over half a million. The fourth, Los Angeles. Uh, 621,000. Uh, Haifa, number three, 655,000. New York, 1.9 million. And the winner is Tel Aviv, the greater Tel Aviv, 2.5 million. Now you see how interspersed the numbers are and the places and the dynamism. These two great communities and the others scattered across the globe are united by shared values, collective memory, and common aspirations. From a United States of America that was created whole cloth out of one-of-a-kind democratic rebellions to create a commonwealth of states that were sovereign to no king but to the citizenry, to an Israel that was created as a haven for a homeless people and to represent nothing short of God's kingdom on earth, our two nations are bound by principles and values that are and must remain above the politics of any moment. But so too must our two Jewish communities, American and Israeli, come together as allies, allies who may disagree and engage in healthy debate, but who see each other as equals. Yet instead of embracing our diversity and creating a true partnership between world Jewry and Israel, there are forces in Israel pulling our two Jewish communities apart. One, the deep frustration, even anger, that the non-Orthodox Jewish majority feels as our religious rights in Israel are denied and the ultra-Orthodox politicians continue to claim even more of Israel's public space and daily life. Two, the alienation many, especially among our young, feel over Israelis' policies towards the Palestinians and readiness to simply dismiss them as being anti-Israel. Three, the attentiveness of Israel's government to Christian evangelicals while turning a cold shoulder to the concerns of a significant portion of American Jews with whom the government disagrees. It is out of this living reality, the deep love and even a deeper belief in Klai Yisrael, the unity of the Jewish people, that I say it's time it's time to shift the paradigm, not just in discourse in noble settings like the one we find ourselves in today, but to reset that relationship in the global sense. Let's stop using the, tape, the, the term diaspora. Uh, it just doesn't work anymore. Diaspora implies a center and a periphery. Let's use the term world jury instead. Let's stop thinking that Israel unilaterally sets the agenda for world Jewry. <coughs> Time has come to replace that statement with an ethos of an interdependent, mutually responsible world Jewish community with two powerful centers, North America and Israel. Are we allowed to have a voice when uh, the chief rabbi of Jerusalem, Shlomo Amar, says that reformed Jews are worse than Holocaust deniers? Is that somehow a sentiment that stays there in his a circle of Jerusalem. No, it, it, it emanates out, and we are all deeply affected. The conversion bill that's right now being debated quietly, the Supreme Court's going to weigh in, and the fear is it is going to entrench all matters of conversion in the ultra-Orthodox. Is that going to affect just the Jewish people in Israel? No, friends. It's going to affect all of us. The Jewish state can't just confine when it rules on matters of Jewish peoplehood or Jewish community. It has an impact, and we must be in those debates and discussions, and even one day we'll figure out how to be in those decisions as well. By the way, this is not new in Jewish history. Remember that the most authoritative Jewish intellectual achievement, the Babylonian Talmud, was created in the 6th century Babylonia. And throughout every period of our history, for the past 2,000 years, more Jews have lived outside of Israel than in our homeland. Make no mistake about it, Jewish life here in North America it's strong. is very strong. Think about it. Today, there are more Jewish books being published, 
more Jewish music, dance, theater, and films being produced, more Jewish courses of study being offered by more universities, case in point, University of Maryland, more synagogues with richer and more extensive Jewish programming than ever before. In some aspects, we surpass, deep breath, in some aspects, we surpass Israel. We're not disappearing, friends. We're not fading away. With all due respect, we have as much to offer Israel often Israel offers us. And the best way to help her leaders understand that is to bring them here. I had a group of members of Knesset in New York. It was Friday afternoon. We'd had a debate with the Orthodox and conservative uh, leaders together. And then we announced to the members of Knesset they were going to synagogue. And uh, the leader of one of the largest coalitions said, he said, no, no, I, I don't do synagogue. We said, you know what? You're going to do synagogue now. We're, we're going. It's only two blocks from there. So we, we walked over to Central Synagogue on Lexington Avenue in New York City. And uh, this member of Knesset in particular was so angry about being coerced. <laughs> said, you're not being coerced. That's what happens in Israel. It's not what happens here. <laughs> but he, he, he not, not an Orthodox Jew. But he was just unhappy. His arms were folded so tightly, I thought he was going to suffocate himself. <laughs> and he sits down, and there are literally, you know, 1,300 people. And he says to me, did you pay these people to be here? <laughs> I said, no, we didn't pay them to be here. They come. It's Shabbat. And they are joyful to be here. And then Rabbi Angela Warnick Bookdahl came to the, uh, the lectern. Rabbi Bookdahl was born in Seoul, Korea. <laughs> one of the most inspiring rabbis on the planet, Shulkunner, you know that from Wexner. And he says, oh, and he leans in. I I'm not going to tell you he became a member of Central Synagogue <laughs> or Beit Daniel in Tel Aviv, but I can tell you when we bring Israeli leaders from across the spectrum of culture and they experience the strength of our movement, they have a new appreciation that we're not dead. We're very much alive. One more story about that. You just have to hear this. So I was meeting with the Prime Minister uh, right after the Kotel Agreement was passed 15 to 5, remember that, in 2016 by the Israeli cabinet, not by the Reform Movement's board, by the Israeli cabinet, to create for the first time an egalitarian pluralistic prayer space at the Western Wall. Well, two weeks afterwards, uh, Yariv Levine, who's the Minister of Tourism, went on, on national television. He said, you know, don't bother giving them a space at the Western Wall, he said. They're going to be gone in a matter of a few years. Really. So the Prime Minister uh, told member of staff, asked Rick, can you go talk to Prime, Minister, to Prime Minister's uh, cabinet member, Yariv Levine? I said, with all due respect, he works for the Prime Minister. So go, I, the Prime Minister tried. You go talk to him. So I'm in the Knesset the next day. I'm walking to a meeting, and there's Yariv Levine coming down the hallway. So I, I went up to him. I put my hand out. I said, Minister Levine, I'm Rabbi Ricky Stott, and he said, I know who you are. <laughs> and I know who you are, and this is not a thoughtful conversation we're having. I said, you think that we are, um, that we're somehow presiding over the end of Judaism. Can I tell you, you're right about one thing. We stand at the door of Jewish life, but you've got the direction all wrong. <laughs> we're not helping people out, we're helping people in, and that strengthens the Jewish community, the Jewish people, and, if we're smart, it will also strengthen the Jewish state. I'm afraid too many of us have stopped trying to find our connection with our Jewish siblings in Israel and North America who dress, vote, and pray and believe differently from us. Why is it possible for me to sit in America, I can sit with Rabbi Shafrin uh, comfortably and uh, openly, and the world doesn't come crashing down, but in Israel, to sit with a member of one of the elite of the ultra-Orthodox, it would never happen. And that is one of our great challenges, but it is an opportunity. The rift today among the Jewish people with two distinct Jewish communities growing in North America and Israel could become irreparable. I don't want to be dire, I just want to be frank. The rift cannot be fixed by invoking tired Jewish communal mantras of we are one. This is not about PR. It's about more enlightened policies. There has to be respect shown for those of us who are committed and passionate. We're the largest movement in Jewish life. Uh, I heard earlier from my ultra-Orthodox colleague that not to be triumphalist, but the reform movement in North America is larger than the Orthodox, conservative, and Reconstructionist movements combined. I don't say that as a boast. I say that as a reflection of where we are. But the big question will be for all of us, what does the future bring? 
and that is up to us. It's simply unacceptable that the only democracy in the world that does not allow full and equal rights to all streams of Judaism is the Jewish state. It's simply unacceptable that our rabbis, our converts, our children, all of the two million plus Jews in North America who embrace the reformed vision of Judaism are considered second class citizens because our rabbis are not given equal status by the Israeli authorities. It is simply unacceptable that Judaism in Israel today is too often seen as coercive, not inspiring. What people can do, can't do, rather than what they can do. At the same time, in spite of the Israeli government's bending to the discriminatory demands of the ultra-Orthodox parties, the non-Orthodox movement in Israel are flourishing and they are growing. Here's some demography, we've heard a lot of numbers, here's one you didn't hear. Reform movement has doubled in the last seven years. We were 3.5% seven years ago. Uh, the most recent study by Camille Fuchs that was taken this past fall, we were at 7.5%. If you add the 3% of conservative Jews, it's roughly 10% of the Israeli Jewish population. What's the other equivalent of about 10%? The ultra-Orthodox po population of Israel. We're roughly the same size but clearly not of the same political influence. That's where we're going. This past November, I was in Jerusalem for the ordination of the 100th Israeli Reform Rabbi. It was a spectacular day. And we took all of the Board of Governors, all the alumni, all the colleagues from out Israel, and we went to the, the little temporary platform at the egalitarian place that was promised, but not yet built. And we had our tefillah, our prayer service, and it was so spirited. But what we didn't want is for that moment to be sequestered from the larger <laughs> plaza of the Western Wall. If you've been to the Western Wall, raise your hand and just get a sense. So you know the larger plaza where there's a wonderful space for Orthodox prayer, men and women separated. So we don't have the, the possibility to use this, the Torah scrolls up on the main plaza. So we brought our own. And I was walking with a giant Sefer Torah. It was, we had paused after our opening of our service. We were going to have our Torah service up in the main plaza. So I'm walking with this Torah scroll, Anat Hoffman, who leads the Women of the Wall, and she also leads our social justice arm in Israel, is on one arm. She's holding on for dear life. And on the other is uh, Orly Erez Vachowski, who is the lead attorney fighting all these big cases in the Supreme Court. So I feel very, very protected. We get to the uh, magnometer, and the uh, guard who's standing, blocking the way, I could see in his eyes, he was saying to himself, please, please, take me somewhere else quickly. <laughs> I, I am in a moment that I am not prepared for. So I, I got up there, and, and not every day does someone walk up to the you know, security checkpoint with a Torah scroll. And he, he got very um, aggressive. And he started to, to really physically keep me back. And honestly, I wasn't pushing. I was just standing there. And then all of a sudden, he snapped. And he took his hand like he was in synagogue. And someone was carrying the Torah around for a procession. And he touched the Torah. And he kissed it. And I thought, OK, this is beautiful. This is what's supposed to happen. But then he forgot that moment. And he took out a can of mace and put it in my face and started to really pummel us. And, and I thought to myself, well, first of all, uh, we're not going back. We came this far, we go forward. And, and we just, in a very gentle way, singing our way in, we came into the main plaza, finished our service, we read the Torah. And I tell you that uh, people ask, you know, is the Kotel thing over? Uh, it's not. And it's not possible that we're going to accept the breadcrumbs that the prime minister is throwing our way. A second-rate space will never be acceptable to the overwhelming majority of Jews in the world. This is not simply about a piece of real estate with deeply symbolic value. It's about our equality as Jews in the Jewish state. And if we can make the, the Kotel a place for all of us friends, we can do it everywhere in the state of Israel and, frankly, around the world, and we will. Almost done. Israel, in her 70th year, is a strong nation, a unique nation, one that can be stronger truly by living up to its founding values. That has been evident today and every day. We, the Jewish community in America, and our brothers and sisters in Israel, can build a vibrant Jewish world for the next 70 years by saying what we are for, not just what we are against. By staking a claim for inclusivity, a Judaism that is informed by the prophets of Israel, a Judaism that lives out the, the mandate to be 
a community of faith and hope and memory and justice and equality. And we can do that in partnership with our two large communities. Israel and the US are two vibrant democracies, and it is that democratic ethos that we celebrate and for which we fight. Let's not be derailed by efforts to boycott or divest, to sanction or to silence. Closing, my wife and I, we bought an apartment in Jerusalem. We bought it during the second intifada. It wasn't the best time to buy something in Israel, but it was so urgent that we have a home, particularly at that moment. Our apartment is down the street from uh, the late Israeli poet Yehuda Amichai. I used to watch him when I was a rabbinic student. He'd be walking always with uh, his little one to Gan uh, as I was on my way to HUC. Vividly recall. Amichai begins his poem, Ba'ir Atika, in the old city with these words. Ochei chagim anachnu, chortei shemot al kol evin, niguei tikva, b'nei aruba shel memshalot historia. We are holiday weepers, engraving our names on every stone, infected by hope, hostages of governments and history. Yes, of late we are too often feeling like the hostages of governments and history. But nonetheless, we are nigue tikva. We, all of us, are infected with hope. Hope is usually thought of as a wish that things would be better than they are. Many of us confuse hope with optimism. Says Harvard professor Jerome Groupman in his book, The Anatomy of Hope, he says, but hope differs from optimism. Hope does not arise from being told to think positively or from hearing an overly rosy forecast. Hope is the elevated feeling we experience when we see in the mind's eye a path to a better future. Hope acknowledges the significant obstacles and deep pitfalls along the path. True hope has no room for delusion. It is in this sense that we have no choice but to follow an arduous and elusive path to that better tomorrow that we desperately need. For us, hope is not a delusion, but rather an imperative. Generations past, present, and future are counting on us. We can't let them down. Thank you. for not getting up. <laughs> but thank you, Rabbi, uh, for a very inspirational... Uh, and uh, we thank you for coming, and uh, you, you've given us a lot of food for thought. Uh, uh, Alma and I are very proud to have been instrumental in es establishing the Gildenhorn Institute for Israel Studies here at the university. We have watched it grow and mature under the leadership of Yoram Perry a distinguished author, scholar, and journalist with extensive involvement in the affairs of Israel. Founded in 2006, the Institute is dedicated to the study of all aspects of Israel society, history, politics, and culture. Part of the mission of the Institute is to pay close attention to the relationship of Israel uh, to countries in the Middle East and the global world. My thanks to Liz Dubin and her late husband, my dear friend, Richard Dubin, for endowing the lecture series over the years. And we thank you, Liz, who's here today. Special thanks to Dean Bonnie Thornton Dill, Dean of the College of Arts and Humanities, and President Wallace Lowe, President of the University of Maryland, who have shown unwavering support for the Institute over the past 12 years. Thank you all for coming today. Uh, we have a interesting program this afternoon, so please, please have lunch and enjoy the day. Not yet. We have a little conversation going. Yeah, I, I was so impressed, <coughs> I was so impressed with your words that I have no, no questions. <laughs> and I think that we'll leave the question for the next panel. So we'll uh, take the break now. We'll meet at two o'clock. Sure. You are you are invited to eat wherever you want here. There are many activities, and and uh, you are staying with us after two o'clock. So we will we'll be able to ask you questions as well. Let's the next panel, which will not be less interesting than the first. <laughs>
Thank you very much.